what do you do when a common pain medication may also be the thing that increases your risk of dementia on down the road? In this video today, we're gonna look at a new study that came out. It's a big study that examined people that took gabapentin for simple chronic low back pain. And the results are staggering in how they affect the later outcomes for developing dementia and mild cognitive impairment. And as a spoiler alert, we're really concerned about the people that are young taking it. So we're gonna talk about it today in the video. I'm Dr. Nathan Kaiser, let's get going. Let's start off with what is gabapentin? How do we use it, right? So gabapentin was originally developed as an anti-convulsant medication. So on-label use would be things like anti-seizure medication, partial seizures specifically, and post-herpetic neuralgia, which would be kind of like shingles. But it comes around at this time where we're also realizing that opioids are wildly addictive and we have to find a different opportunity for people that are dealing with pain. So they began to shift toward an off-label usage of gabapentin to try to try to deal with pain, especially peripheral pain, um, to be able to move people away from opioids. This is where especially lower back pain becomes really important because that's going to be one of the most common reasons to utilize it. Um, so we have a huge cohort of people in the United States with chronic low back pain. We've got opioids, that's not going to cut it anymore, way too addictive, huge challenge. So gabapentin kind of starts to fill that role. Um, but immediately, we know there are side effects that come with that. And if we think of the big three, we're starting to look at, we, we're starting to see that this relationship between trying to balance out pain relief versus brain health becomes immediately important because the big side effects are going to be dizziness. They're going to be drowsiness, brain fog. So we know right away that the action that it's taking is not just limiting a pain response, but it's also decreasing other functions that are happening in the brain. The study that really sheds light on this is titled Risk of Dementia Following Gabapentin Prescription in Chronic Low Back Pain Patients by Agrari. And it really points this out. I'm going to give you a little bit of the study design just so you understand it. So they basically looked at um, a big database over the course of 20 years. So 20, 2004 up till 2024. And they looked at adults that were diagnosed with chronic low back pain. And they excluded people that already had previous gabapentin use for other things, that already had dementia, already had epilepsy, stroke, cancer. So they're trying to rule out other things that could potentially be confounding the data. And they basically found that patients that had been prescribed six or more rounds of gabapentin had a 29% higher risk of dementia compared with people that had never used gabapentin. If we look at the same group of people, they had an 85% higher risk of mild cognitive impairment. And if you're asking about what mild cognitive impairment is, it's kind of like, if you take the words apart, that's kind of what it sounds like. So you're cognitively impaired, but it's not so bad that it's dementia, but it's not good. So this is super important. And um, if you just think about that, 85% higher risk is, is astounding. And then if we take that a step further and we look at younger adults, and these would be people 16 to 60, or excuse me, 18 to 64, um, they had more than double the risk of developing dementia and MCI versus people that don't use gabapentin. So looking at that, the risk even gets worse the more you've taken. So if we're getting into 12 um, prescriptions of gabapentin or more, we get even higher risk factors going up. So that's that's not ideal. It's important to, to note with that, that it that doesn't descriptively say like taking the gabapentin is causing the risk of dementia, the risk of mild cognitive impairment, but they're correlated, right? So there are two things that go together. We're observing this thing is happening in the world, um, but it doesn't necessarily prove that there is causation. We don't have exact dosage. We don't have um, duration, but we just know that those two things tend to trend together. So the more gabapentin you're taking, the more the risk goes up of uh, developing these neurocognitive problems. What this does though is help us pose kind of the really important question, which is how do we balance this trade-off between dealing with pain and dealing with the potential for causing problems in our brain later on? From a mechanistic basis, we do know that when we use gabapentin, it does affect calcium channels in the brain. So it is going to have like a known effect of altering brain function. So this starts to call in, do we need to look at other ways to manage 
pain within, especially low back pain, but that could be pain across the board, right? And so from my bias, my perspective, it opens up the door to think about alternative therapies that are actually shown to be very good at helping with chronic pain that may not carry some of the risk or being able to use them in tandem so that we can use medications as a way to maybe provide a short-term relief while also trying to address the causality so that this doesn't become a chronic factor where we're, we're accumulating um, this usage over time. So those are considerations that I think are, are very helpful. Some of the common alternatives or people call them alternatives, we would think about them as more conservative paths, right? Might be things that are more directed toward the tissue itself or the processing of a pain signal. So this is where things like chiropractic care, non-surgical decompression, acupuncture, physical therapy, uh, massage, all of these tools in the toolbox become really important because of the, the risk that they carry is very low, given the fact that they also have a high probability of affecting the outcome. Now, they're not the same as taking a medication. That's a way lower friction, way more available. So I understand the usage and medication can be good if you're just in writhing suffering and you're trying to get through that as quick as possible. Anybody who's ever experienced chronic pain knows that like that is the whole focus of your life when you're feeling poorly. But once that's managed, then taking that next step and saying, well, okay, now what can I do so that I can make myself stronger, so I can make this system stronger, so that I'm not having to deal with this on an ongoing basis, um, where I'm getting into that chronicity of, of use. And now we start to balance out this idea of how we're managing the pain, but not sacrificing performance of our brain later down the road, because guess what? The part that we're not considering in all of this is that as that brain deteriorates in functionality, we also run the risk of being more prone to other sorts of pain syndromes. So this is really important that we don't kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater, that we're able to say, let's work on health rather than just clearly or simply eliminating the pain cycle. But how do we just remove the thing that is is causing that pain in the first place? For some people that may not be available, but a lot of people, especially with chronic pain, uh, that is something that is available to them in ways that are, are very approachable. So that would kind of be my, my sense of what to take away from that. If you're someone that's already on gabapentin, obviously this is a medical advice. I'm not a medical doctor, but things that you could start to consider as you conceptualize it for yourself are, if I'm on it, are there ways where I can start to do other things that will help me to be able to offset that? Can I work with my physician in order to try to find those? Um, most physicians are very amenable to trying to find ways to, to help promote long-term health while also limiting pain in the near term. So you wanna be monitored, you wanna be make, sh make sure that we're not having you know changes like dizziness, memory loss, feeling slowed down, brain fog, um, you know, difficulty with motor tasks. All of these things are little subtle signals that um, we want to be moving toward an alternative that may be more useful over the long term. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for this in future research. Obviously, we want to look at, are we getting into causal data? One of the things that doesn't come up in this is maybe we're just finding that people that are more prone to having that continuous low back pain because of that sensory processing, maybe that is actually the thing that the mild cognitive impairment or the dementia is actually starting first and the sign of that is pain. We don't know. But from my perspective, it's kind of like, both fine, work on trying to solve both problems. Can I can I solve the underlying problem so I'm reducing pain and maintaining brain health at the same time? And I think that that's a problem worth solving. Um, so just keep that in mind. When you read the headline, it doesn't mean that for every gabapentin you take, that you know you're gonna you're gonna get dementia, but it's a thing to pay attention to the relationship between pain, brain function, and the medications we use to try to solve it, the trade-offs that come with it. And hopefully channels like these help to try to just expose people to, to more options that are available that they can use in their toolkit together to be able to get to a better outcome. So leave us a comment. Let, us, let me know what you think about this. People that are in pain, obviously, is a tough game. So we want to do our very, very best to try to help them not just get out of the suffering, but get back to living a healthy life. So hope it helps. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.